about Jesus today. Now he came to be everything we need. So we're going to lift up our voices, encourage each other. Praise his name, all right? To run to my rescue, oh my Redeemer, you take the pieces and turn them to praises, oh my Redeemer, oh my Redeemer. him the applause. That's who gets our applause is Jesus. No other love, no other name, no other. He came and took our place. He came and paid our ransom. That's right. <laughs> Got an amen from the pastor. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, not exactly an amen, but yes, it's good. I'll take it. I'll take it. singing about Jesus today. He took our, our place. He paid for our sin. 
and it's ours for free. Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years, and still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? God. You may have a seat. Let me read out of Psalm 107 and uh, for your hearing as we begin this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandering in desert waste, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, for he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Is anybody hungry this morning? Yes. To receive from him, because he is a good God. It's not what you can do for yourself. It's what he can do for you. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
Welcome to Crossroads Church of Dunwoody. Thrilled that you've chosen to be here. If you're a guest with us, you've come to the right place. I'm just telling you, you're at the right place. The Lord has led you here. By God's sovereign grace, he wants you to be here today. Uh, we have a special get, uh, gift for you if you're a guest. Uh, we have some information about our church. If you would either go online to uh, www.guest.gift, you can do that on your cell phone, your tablet, or you can just step right outside these doors to the left and, uh, and be welcomed by our, uh, our guest services uh, folks there, and uh, they will love on you and, and give you some good things. For the remainder of us that are here every week, thank you that you came back. Yes, I'm wearing a t-shirt today. I've been hammered by some of you. Some of you look like twins today, you know, but uh, I have not been wearing my t-shirt last few weeks, and uh, I'll just call him out. Jim Jennings has let me know as an elder that I'm under rebuke, and so uh, I put my t-shirt on this morning. Two reasons I put this on. One, because Jim reminds me every week, where's that t-shirt, man? Um, second reason is because when I got up to get dressed this morning and was leaving the house, I got up earlier than my family, and I would not want to incur the wrath of my wife by flipping on the lights and ironing another shirt that I had not yet ironed. So the t-shirt was just easy uh, to get with my little cell phone, find it in the drawer. Oh, there it is. So I put that on. So that was part of the reason I'm wearing this today as well. Uh, these are exciting days at Crossroads. Let me let you know just about a few things that are happening. This Friday night, our academy is hosting a, an outdoor movie event. Um, $5 per car and people show up and all the money's going to go to uh, playground equipment that we're going to upgrade and do some things for. Uh, but also some of you have participated in the past with the bake sale that goes on with that. So if you want to contribute to that again, uh, certainly see Jamie Moore about those uh, things or you can just bring something up uh, and give it to somebody in the office that's not me because some of that may not make it to the event if you hand it to me. Um, uh, this is also one of the, uh, a special time in the, in the history of our church and, and church uh, worldwide. This is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And I kind of highlight that because that's a big deal. Uh, we're not sitting here as Catholics in a church uh, praying a rosary or, or seeking uh, for the Pope to bless us. All right. The Catholic monk, um, Martin Luther, uh, a German monk, uh, stepped up and realized that what the Bible was saying is not what the church at that time was teaching. They were uh, telling people they could get out of purgatory or, or buy um, uh, some uh, less than time of their ancestors in purgatory by buying indulgences. And he knew, based on the scriptures, that it's by faith alone through Christ alone that we're saved. And he started what was known as the Protestant Reformation. Uh, his desire was to reform the church, but the Pope wouldn't have it. And so Protestant comes the word protest. He was protesting the church, saying, you're getting it wrong. You're leading people astray from what the Bible says. It's not what popes and councils say. It's what Jesus himself has said that determines our faith. Well, because the Pope at that time wouldn't have that, there was the Protestant Reformation, and therefore all of us as evangelicals or Presbyterians or Baptists or, or Methodists or, or Episcopalians all come under the Protestant banner. It's been 500 years since that time, October 31st, 1517. And so we want to highlight a couple of times where we can educate ourselves about the blessed, uh, those who've gone before us to lead us to the path that we're on now. On Saturday, October 28th, Annabelle Bash and is leading out on a, a Reformation party for our children, and adults can be included. Uh, if you would like more information, please see her or call the church office, but it'll be a great time at our gym on that Saturday evening. On Sunday evening, I'm going to be showing a, a, a brand new Luther documentary, uh, well done, I will say, and we'll be showing that either in, in this room or, or downstairs in our fellowship hall on the Sunday evening and showing that. It's an hour and a half uh, long, well worth your time. And so that'll be a, a good time for us to be together. But our time now is for focus on how we can give an offering to God. I've been trying to change the language here. We often say, well, we're going to take our offering. Well, that may happen in some places in the United States where they take your offering. But here we just receive it freely as you choose to give. And so let's pray that God would bless our time of giving, that his ministry may be expanded. You can do that through a traditional way uh, where you can write a check or give cash. I know that's uh, very common. But some of the newer generation I know says, can we just do this online? So we've set up an establishment to do that, crossroads.gift. Or, and I, we're looking at how you can do that through text since that's been uh, asked of us many times. 
But we'll work on that. But let's pray for our offering, and then we'll receive that. Father, thank you for the grace you give us and all that you're doing uh, in our lives today and what you've done throughout history and what you're going to do in the future. I pray that, Father, that as we focus our minds on your word and your truth, we would be compelled to participate, not only financially, but physically. How can we be involved with what you're doing? I pray that you would bless the ministry of Crossroads Church and bless the lives who are here and participating. In Jesus' name, amen.
songs, right? A lot of truth. Nothing. 
nothing gets us to God but Jesus. Absolutely nothing. So to count on anything else, it's crazy. So that's why we sing about it, to remind ourselves of the awesome grace, awesome power, the amazing sacrifice that Jesus made, that God made through Jesus for us. And he would have done it for just one of us. Glorify your name. 
We glorify your name, Lord, in all the earth. The highest praise is yours. The highest praise is yours. The highest praise is yours in all the earth. We glorify you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We thank you. We love you. We worship you. called men and women to himself in order to glorify his name and what drives our time for the next few moments is the word of God I want us to hear what he has to say to us the church uh, as he's adding folks uh, men women boy and girls uh, from all over the world to his uh, ever-growing uh, body it's exciting that as we look verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, we're, we're getting a bigger picture, a bigger vision of, what, of who God is and our involvement in what he's doing, what he has done for us and what he's going to do through us. If you would, get your Bibles and open it to Ephesians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to pick up one of the red Bibles in the pew rack right in front of you, and you can turn to page 976. We've been walking verse by verse through this book ever so slowly, but ever so uh, richly to, to draw out what Paul is communicating to us uh, by God's Holy Spirit uh, revealing truth. In this series, we are calling Dream Bigger, God's Power, God's People. Let me just, uh, for our own benefit, look at your translation that you're holding, the Bible that you're holding. I'm going to read verse 1 through 10 today, and then we're going to narrow down and begin to work on verse 7 uh, as we progress forward. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of, the glorious, of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the very blood we were singing about, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in on earth. Father, may you bless the reading of your word and give us today insight, illumination by your spirit to, to draw out what you have for us here. 
Father, these, these words are timeless. But Father, our understanding of it uh, is very limited. So I pray, if it pleases you, would you explode our minds open to take in the richness of your lavish grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we look at the, this epistle, this letter that Paul has written to the church, and not just for the church in Ephesus, but uh, to be sent to, to all the churches in the region and beyond. It's not addressing a particular problem in one particular church, but giving a foundation and a vision of what the church is to be in all generations. And Paul has laid out who he is and who we are if we are in Christ. And then he addresses God as the, the blessed one, the one worthy of receiving praise, the one who is so full within the, the triune Godhead, worthy of praise, and that he has chosen out of that to bless those who would trust in him, to trust in Christ, to follow him. He has chosen to bless and to draw close in relationship those who are by faith uh, giving their lives to Christ. In this blessed triune uh, Godhead, he has blessed us in, in many ways. And verses 3 all the way through the end of verse 14, everyone in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is involved in blessing. They have a role to play as they bring you gifts for those who are in Christ. The Father takes the, the initiative as he chooses us and changes us and, and calls us children, how he loves us and cherishes us giving us those gifts, and, and we respond with celebration. The Son gives us the blessing to redeem us for unity, and we'll see this in verse 7 through 10. And then the Spirit of God is also involved, and, and His blessing, His gift to us is to seal us for an inheritance, and we'll look at that in a few weeks. Today, my focus is for us to see what Christ has done, to, that, that Paul opens up the curtain to see what the, 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 the Godhead has, has discussed and, and decided in their own sovereign will, the pleasure they have to bless us. As the Father has, has blessed us, now the Son is blessing us. And uh, there are five blessings from the Son. And I believe in our time today, we'll have time for two of them. So it'll be short in slides, but rich in content, I trust. So as we look at verse 7, I want you to see the blessing of the Son is to redeem us for unity. The first blessing he gives us is we are redeemed. In him we have redemption through his blood. We could read that and, and, and run by it really fast, but, but not if we want to understand the weight of truth here. That this is a, a package much larger than we could ever imagine. The word redeemed is an essential part of Christianity. Here the Father has chosen us and changed us and, and made us children. But all of that is only possible if someone was willing to redeem us. To pay the penalty, the price that kept us separated from God. The theological definition is that redeemed means it's an act of God by which he himself pays as a ransom the price for sin that was an offense to his own holiness. A simple definition is, is a deliverance of sinners by the payment of a huge price. In the New Testament, as it writes it in Greek, there are two Greek words for redemption and used in two different ways. One of the Greek words is uh, Agarazo or ex agarazo. It means to, to go into a marketplace and to, to, ex means to pull out, to buy and pull out of the marketplace something for your own self. Every one of us have been to the store and, and, and redeemed something. Perhaps you took coupons and even got a better deal. In the first hour, I, I was uh, uh, bragging on you, I guess I could say. Uh, Dwight is a, a coupon expert or has been in his past. He would get stores to actually give away products to him and nearly pay him to come shop. It, it was insane. Do you guys still do that? Yep. So if you ever need little bottles of shampoo, go to their house. They've got a, a, more than enough. But we, we all go to, to places to say, I would like to, 
to, to rescue that product that, that I just so desperately want. And you're willing to fork over money to, to purchase that out of the marketplace and you have it. And whether you like it 10 days later or not is, is up to you. But you wanted it, so you purchased it. That's one of the words for redemption in the Greek New Testament. But the other word is apolutrosis. Apolutrosis. It means to pay a price to free a person who is in slavery or bondage. It's a much weightier definition. In the Roman first century world, where Rome conquered and, and had control of all things, there were millions of people, but there were six million, approximately 10 to 15 percent of the population, who were slaves. And it had nothing to do with the color of their skin. Sometimes they were prisoners of war. Rome had conquered an area and, and taken their soldiers uh, from the, uh, the opposing uh, uh, army and made them slaves to, to be servants for those who were the conquerors. Some were uh, slaves because of the pirate ships that would conquer another ship and take them into their own custody and, and make them work for them. Some were because they could not afford to live any longer and they would either sell themselves to be a slave to someone else or when times were bad they would sell their own children in order to make it they had multiple children and certainly they could they get get rid of a few if they were worth something slavery was very common in that culture now you and I we don't live in that kind of culture any longer so we, we and, and, and see, it's such a distant concept, but someone in slavery because of, of someone just taking over their lives, they had no freedom. And some of these were highly skilled workers, uh, accountants, uh, physicians, not just manual labor in the first century, just people who were conquered and put into bondage by a controlling master. Remember the Old Testament, even Joseph was sold by his own brothers to slavery. He became an Egyptian slave. There was no way out of slavery. When you were a slave, it wasn't like you just spent 10 years or 15 years and you were done. It wasn't indentured servanthood. It was you were owned for life unless on the rare occasion someone took an interest in you and said, I would like to redeem them. They would raise enough money. They would have something in their possession. They could go to the master and negotiate a rate and say, I'd like to redeem this particular slave from you, to take them out of the bondage that you have them in, and I will pay the entire price. What is it? And once they had purchased that, or paid that price and purchased that person, they would take them out and say, I have redeemed you, and you are now free. Go live your life. Now you can imagine a slave who, who had no hope or no future. If somebody were to do that, the gratitude, the, the love that you would then be sharing back with that individual who rescued you, who redeemed you. You wouldn't take that for granted. It would have changed your entire life. That's the word being used here, that Christ has redeemed us. Well, that's all fine and good, but if we're not slaves, what does this have to do with us? Are we slaves? Are we in bondage? Everyone looks pretty free today. No one's got shackles on. You all chose what clothes you were going to put on this morning. You, you chose to come here today. Perhaps you walked or you rode a bike or you, or you rode in a car. You have some freedoms, it seems like. But according to the Bible, when it speaks about Christ redeeming people, he's saying that every one of us are in bondage to sin. And yes, you are a slave. Jesus said himself, in John chapter 8, verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You're in bondage. And you might say to yourself, well, but I'm not a slave like the first century, and they couldn't work their way out of it. That's just the culture. But I, I, yeah, maybe I'm a slave to sin, but I can stop at any time. I can just choose to stop sinning, and I can just be righteous. Really? Really? All right, homework assignment. This week, when you leave today at 12 o'clock, you can have till 12, but at 12 o'clock, sinning stops. You can't sin again until 1045 when you return, and you're going to testify about that next week up here on the stage. How many takers do I have? 
How many of you can go throughout the entire week and you're not going to have a bad thought? You're not going to say something wrong? You're not going to cut someone off at, on 285? Uh, you're going to do everything you're supposed to do at the right time? You're going to make sure you have your quiet time and you're so invested, even tithing your time to the Lord, 2.4 hours a day that you're just going to focus on Him? You're, you're going to be so in tune with God that you're not going to have time to sin. You might be able to do that, perhaps, but... If you were a monk and you could hide away for a week, but if you're going to interact with anybody else, I'm sure the temptation will be there. Don't look at your spouse right now and tell them, I've got you, I'm watching. These things have it because you know why? We, without Christ, are a slave to it and are incapable of breaking out of it. Even in our best days, our works are like filthy rags, God says. Romans chapter 6, verse 17, it says, you who were once slaves of sin. Romans 7, 14 says, I am in the flesh. I'm sold under sin, Paul writes. In Romans 8, 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. The whole creation is under this sin curse. We were born sinners, and we live out that sin nature. You can't break away even if you desire to. Unfortunately, most of us don't desire to. Maybe one day you feel guilty and you're saying, oh, i got to stop doing that. But even your own self-will, even your own set calendar, even your own best laid plans, you draw back and, and you break your promise again. In Titus chapter 3, verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Sounds like our culture today. Second uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 19, They are slaves of corruption for whatever out, uh, overcomes a person so that he is enslaved. One of our biggest sins, I think, is that we are very good at judging others for sins that they have that we aren't guilty of. Oh, look at them. How in the world could they be hooked on alcohol? How could they be involved in drugs? How could they be cheating on their spouse? That is just awful. I would never do that. Well, what is it that you do have a passion for? Where is your kryptonite, the weakness that you have, that when you're tempted by it, you give into it almost every time? See, we are really good at judging other people by the sins that they have, but what about ourselves? Do we consider ourselves in bondage to sin without Christ? Are we, are we truly uh, slaves to the master of sin saying, you need to do this, and you might say, well, I don't really want to. All right, just this one time, but I'm going to say I'm sorry tomorrow. Continually, we have a nature of living out sin without any hope if we do not have Christ. But the good news is, in Him, we have redemption. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. We are redeemed. What is the price of this sin? nature that we have. It tells us in, in six, uh, Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. That's it. God set up the standard. He says, for the wages of sin, what you earn when you work so hard living out your sin, you have earned death. Now, if you worked all week at your company, and at the end of the week they said, hey, thanks for volunteering, you'd be a little ticked off. You say, no, I worked really hard. I've earned this. But when it's put in this context, the wages, what, you, you, what you've earned, you worked hard for, you should be crying out, yes, give me what I earned. But none of us want that. None of us want eternal death, separation from God. But that's exactly what the sin that we live out is worth to God. The penalty is, it is separation from God, eternal death. It's just the reality. But that verse doesn't stop there. It has, but... There's a contrast, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, the Redeemer. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. I mean, consider some of the aspects 
of this redemption. This verse tells us who the Redeemer is. In Him, we have redemption. In the end of verse 6, it says, The Beloved. In the Beloved. Beloved, there is Christ. In Him is Christ. Later in this section, it says, In Christ. So we know the Redeemer is Jesus Himself. And there's only one Redeemer. Jesus does not show multiple Redeemers in the New Testament. There is one in Christ alone, and we sang it. Well, who are the redeemed? It says we here. In chapter 2, verse 1, it explains further about who this us or we are that are redeemed, those who have been bought at a price. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 2 in chapter 2, it says, in which you once walked through the course of this world. Down in verse 12, it says, remember that you were at this time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Those without hope and without God are those who desperately need to be redeemed and cannot do it on their own. The redeemed are those who were in their sin, but God in his marvelous grace chose to redeem them out of the bondage of sin. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. In Luke chapter 5, verse 32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Because sinners are those who are separated from God. When they recognize the enslavement that they're in, when they recognize that they are a front to, to God's holiness, that only in that recognition that you are separated, you're a sinner, and you're a slave, might you be open to crying out to God, who is the only one who can redeem you, the only one who can rescue you. It's not until a person recognizes this that they'll ever call out to God like Peter did when he was sinking in the water with Jesus. Lord, save me. Salvation is not about God picking the best of the best, but saving those who recognize that they are broken and sinful and unable to save themselves. So the Redeemer is Christ alone. The redeemed are those who recognize their sin and separate from God and the bondage that they are in. But what was the price that had to be paid? According to this verse, it says, through his blood. This isn't one of these positions where we go, well, God, I'm just sorry. And he goes, oh, just, just forget about it. Let's just sweep that under the rug. It's okay. There are some benevolent grandfathers in here that if, if the grandchild took a baseball and, and threw it through his window or, or smashed some heirloom, you might get a little upset for a little while, but I know you love your grandkids. You go, oh, that's okay. I'll just give you a hug. God doesn't just say, it's okay. He's a loving God, yes, but he is a holy and just God. And if he says the wages of sin is death, he's not recanting on that statement. So either we will pay that penalty or by his grace, he sent Jesus, and Jesus will pay that penalty on our behalf. This is weighty. So Jesus in, in the Godhead and in, in all of heaven has taken on the role saying, I, out of my own benevolence and generosity, out of my sovereign will and good pleasure, I will take on human flesh. I will come incarnate. I will come as a baby, but as an innocent, perfect baby. I will live a, a complete, perfect life. I will show you what it means to, to be in me. But then I will, as my entire purpose of coming is, I will die on a cross, taking the wrath of God onto myself, all the sin that you, as, as people, have committed. I will put onto myself. I will take the full wrath of God and suffer the penalty and redeem you from where your everlasting destruction is leading. In him we have redemption through his blood. When we look at the cross, we understand that he was not obligated to do so. But in his benevolence, his, his lavishing love he gives to us, 
He didn't just look at our sin and look away. He was willing to take it on. That's a big deal. There was no other way. God had, had established that without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sins. That's why we sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Now, throughout church history, people have tried to, 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 to mar this, this doctrine of what's known as substitutionary atonement. Penal, penalty, and substitute. You are standing in uh, a position of sin and bondage that you will suffer the consequences of that or Jesus says, I will take your place and, and I will take your sin upon me and then you'll go stand in my place and I'll put my righteousness on you. But I'll take the full wrath. I will be a substitute for you. You are stepping away while I step in to your shoes. But some liberal theologians over the years have said, no, that just seems so harsh. That just seems so wrong. That uh, Frederick Schleimarker, a German theologian of, of many years ago, would, would say, no, that's not what, what God wants to do. He's not being a, Jesus not being a substitute for you. I want to make sure I say this right. He said that Christ did not die in place of sinners, bearing the wrath of a righteous God. Instead, Christ's death and resurrection merely demonstrated God's love so that human beings might, they might choose to love him back. Most recently, Rob Bell, who used to serve as a pastor, has publicly stated similar views of a moral influence theory of the atonement rather than substitution. He didn't stand in your place, they say. He was just showing, isn't this loving that he was doing all he could? Hopeful that you might recognize that he was willing to sacrifice, but it doesn't do any good for you. That's an affront to God's holiness and the clear biblical teachings. If you've ever seen anything in the Old Testament or New Testament, you realize there had to be a sacrifice to cover the sins of the people. Old Testament, what did they have? They had the annual Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, and they would have uh, the, the, the slaughter of the, of the bulls and the goats, and they would have these two goats that the, the priest would take one of them and slaughter and sprinkle his blood because there had to be a blood shed. And it was sprinkled on the altar. There was a sacrifice on behalf of the people. There was another goat that they would have. And the high priest would place his hands on that goat. And he would pray and symbolically transfer all the sins of Israel for that entire year onto the head of that goat. And then they would take that goat outside the camp and lead it so far away that it could never find its way back. It was called the scapegoat. And Christ stepped in a position in the New Testament and took both of those roles. His blood was shed to redeem you. And the sins that he took away from you were sent on him and it was going to be taken as far as the east is from the west, never to find its way back. This redemption by his blood is not just some moral Stance, hoping that you might recognize he was somewhat of a, a, a loving God. This was a penal substitution standing in your place, and he took the full wrath on your behalf. And it was all part of God's sovereign plan before the foundation of the world. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world and was made manifest in these last times for your sake. Not only is this position and gift uh, uh, that he gives us of, re, uh, of being redeemed, that's a great gift. He also, in this text, you'll notice, is that we are forgiven. We'll move to the second slide here. We are forgiven. The forgiveness of our trespasses. As I've mentioned about the, the, the two goats and, and the Day of uh, Atonement, Yom Kippur, this, this scapegoat, we are forgiven. 
It's not a temporary forgiveness. It's not an annual sacrifice that we have to do. When Christ died, it was sufficient for all time. All of your sins, past, present, and future, would be put on the life of Christ and his death he would take with him. Then he was risen from the dead, conquering that. This forgiveness, this word means to remove or send away, never to return again. That is what Jesus did with our guilt and our sin. In Micah chapter 7, listen to these words. Who is, uh, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in the steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. That's why I praise God for what he has done. And when I see words like that, and knowing that God takes our sin as far as the east is from the west, he throws them to the depth of the sea, he is not forgetful, but he chooses not to remember them. He's not going to bring them back up. Satan is, is the artist of, of, of imagination who comes up and says, you remember what you did back then? And he tries to bring you down and, 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 and bring you back to temptation and the weakness because he, he tries to remind you of your past. But you need to remind him of your present and your future. God has redeemed me because I'm in Christ. And he's taken all those things and has chosen not to remember. Therefore, I am not going to do any more than what God has already done. Trust in him for what he has done. Do we deserve this type of redemption? Does deserve this type of forgiveness? No. But Jesus loves us enough to give us redemption and forgiveness. You know, this gift of salvation that he offers that is found only in him. When we were guilty, he took our punishment. When we are debtors, he pays our debt. When we are strangers, he makes us sons and daughters through adoption. When we are enemies, he brings us close and calls us friends. And when we are slaves, he buys our freedom and calls us saints. How many of us need forgiveness? Every one of us. You know those secret places in your life, those, those areas that you have not been able to conquer in and of yourself. You've tried everything, maybe even bought some self-help books or went to a counselor, spoke to a pastor, but there are some things that continue to drag you down. I want you to rest in Christ that he forgives you and he will help you to overcome all sin. Perhaps it's just the acknowledgement that he has forgiven and you just need to come to him. Whether you've ever come to Christ or not, maybe today would be the day that you give your life fully to him and receive what he has offered on your behalf. Let me share a story out of Ernest Hemingway's short story, The Capital of the World. No one could really say why he ran away. Or perhaps he didn't. He was kicked out of his home by his father for something foolish he had said or did. Either way, Paco found himself wandering the streets of Madrid, Spain, uh, Madrid, Spain, with hopes of entering into a profession that would most likely get him killed, bullfighting. Those who train under a mentor have a good chance of surviving this profession, but Paco's memory of his mistakes and his guilt over what had happened blindly drove him to this one-way street, suicide. But that was the last thing his father wanted, which is why he tried something desperate, which he desperately hoped would work. There was little to no chance that he would ever be able to find Paco on the streets of Madrid, so instead he put an advertisement in the local newspaper, El Libro. The advertisement read this. 
Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Paco. Paco, and is such a common name in Spain that when the father went to the Hotel Montana the next day at noon, there were 800 Pacos waiting to be forgiven. The forgiveness that they sought. There are more than 800 Pacos in our world that so desperately know they need forgiveness. And God is calling out, saying, I'm, I'm Papa. I'm Abba, and out of my lavish love, I've done all by, to redeem you and to forgive you. 1 John chapter 2 says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Colossians, or Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is no hope without Christ. In Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, the Spirit of God calls men and women to recognize that redemption is needed and forgiveness is given freely. Would you pray with me today as we conclude? Father, it is in your grace. It's your grace to even explain to us in your holy word the gifts that you are granting us. I pray that if we are, have been blinded to the truth of that and the weight of that, I pray that you would lift that from the eyes. That, take off the scales. Let us see clearly uh, the depth of our sin, the hopelessness we have in ourselves, and then lift our hearts and our heads to see the beauty the lavish, sovereign love you have to offer Christ as a Redeemer and to provide full forgiveness. Father, I pray today that if there was someone still under the weight of sin and they still have not embraced your forgiveness, I pray today they would do so. And for believers in this room who, who have received your grace and, and understand your forgiveness. I pray that they are not being weighed down by past memories, but embracing the future that you are providing. To dream bigger and to rest that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your truth and thank you for continuing to, to work in and through our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us as we conclude our service today? I'm going to be out in the lobby uh, to receive you if uh, you'd like to speak uh, about any of these issues. talk to someone today about about your sin don't leave here without settling that issue all right because Jesus died for you 
and me. Jesus paid it all, all to him alone. Sin had left the crimson stain, but it washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but it washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, but it washed it white as snow.